It is the 18th of May, 1972. One of the most extraordinary and controversial meetings in British history is about to take place. Queen Elizabeth II will reunite with her dying uncle, the Duke of Windsor, who changed the course of her life 36 years earlier. Here was a young, effective, ambitious queen visiting her uncle who had abdicated the throne and been living in exile and disgrace from the royal family for decades. I mean, there's been so much speculation over the decades about this historic meeting. The weight of the abdication and the stories and the myths that have built up subsequently meant that everyone was fascinated by the fact that the Queen made this deliberate stop in Paris to visit her uncle. No member of the royal family had been to visit the Windsors in their Parisian home. The visit was intended as a private affair, though the French police mounted a massive security operation around the house. She was finally making the journey to make amends or paper over the cracks in a way that none of her relatives in the royal family had done before. What really took place during this clandestine meeting? And what was said in the private conversation between the Queen and her dying uncle? The Duke of Windsor, formerly King Edward VIII, and his niece Elizabeth, now Queen Elizabeth II. He brought into the young Princess Elizabeth's life, glamour, excitement, interest. His abdication of responsibility meant her destiny changed, everything changed overnight. We must give nothing less than the whole of ourselves. When he chose his relationship with Wallace Simpson over his duty to crown and country, it caused Britain's biggest constitutional crisis. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. Once the favorite uncle of the young Princess Elizabeth went into exile, there was the beginnings of a serious family feud. When Elizabeth was crowned queen, what became of her relationship with her uncle? Elizabeth was kept away from Edward as something pure would be kept away from something dirty. How was her view affected by bitter family conflict? The Queen and, of course, the Queen Mother ultimately held the Duke of Windsor responsible for what they saw as the premature death of their father. Tonight we ask, what did Edward and Elizabeth really think of each other? I think the Queen has occasionally referred to the Duke of Windsor as my silly uncle. It's like a Greek drama playing itself out in the 20th century. At Edward and Wallace's chateau outside Paris, a pivotal moment in royal history is about to take place. A meeting 36 years in the making, and only the sixth time the Queen would confront her uncle since he gave up the throne. It's almost impossible to overestimate how much every second of this visit would have meant to Edward. He had waited his entire married life, 36 years, for his wife to have been honored by the royal family. Royal biographer Hugo Vickers was at the chateau the day before the Queen's arrival. He witnessed the preparations himself. I was sent around to see all the private secretaries of all the members of the royal family, and I happened to arrive the day before the Queen, which was particularly interesting because the house was being prepared for this visit, so there were flowers everywhere, there were footmen wandering about, there was a lot of activity, the telephone kept ringing. The emotional and historic significance of this event was not lost on any of the family, and it seems that Wallace was the most anxious of all. This in itself was an historic moment. The first time the woman for whom King Edward VIII gave up the throne of England has been hostess to her niece by marriage, Queen Elizabeth. Wallace had filled the houses with white orchids. She wore a navy blue uh, Christian Dior dress. You know, she was an impeccable hostess. Wallace was described as flitting about the house like a kind of mad bat. It was very carefully planned because Buckingham Palace knew perfectly well that the Duke was on his last legs. 
And the state visit to France gave an opportunity for the Queen to visit him in Paris and not make a special pilgrimage to see him, which would have been over the top, they, th they thought. Back home in the UK, the Queen faced serious tensions across the country. The government had declared a state of emergency due to the coal miners' strikes. Her meeting with the Windsors took place during her official state visit to France, where she was attempting to smooth political frictions with Europe. The Duke knew that the Queen was coming, so he was very determined to keep going as long as possible, because it was a kind of final act of reconciliation, if you like. Edward was just days away from death. Royal experts have since gained a unique insight into what took place. The Duke of Windsor, of course, was kept upstairs. He couldn't come down to tea. He couldn't share the tea with the Queen Elizabeth and with uh, the Duke of Edinburgh and Charles. And that was a terrible blow to him. As Sir Martin Chartres, her private secretary said, while they were having tea, they discussed everything and anything except the one thing which was on everybody's mind, which was the poor man dying in the room upstairs. The Queen went up alone to spend about 15 minutes with her uncle. And, you know, although he was basically bedridden, he was on a drip. He insisted on getting out of bed into clothes. The momentous visit is dramatized in the award-winning series, The Crown. So how much of what we see is fact? Or fiction. Her Majesty the Queen, sir. Oh, no, please don't. <laughs> As the Crown represents it, he made huge efforts to get up. It was a slightly macabre visit because he had to be detached from all the various tubes that were uh, uh, that were going into him. He only had one drip left um, that he that he had to have, and he got up and he made this huge effort, and and he bowed to the Queen. It was really the last thing he could do to acknowledge her as his Queen, acknowledge his loyalty and respect of her. I think there was never a sense that he thought she was doing anything other than an exemplary job. And also in typical sort of British spirit, she asked how he was and he was dying and he said, not so bad. Their conversation in those 15 minutes has been the subject of speculation for decades. In The Crown, it's portrayed as a highly emotional one. There's a key line in the scene where Edward says to Elizabeth, for what I did to you, forgive me. As if he's been spending years absorbing the fallout of his abdication, which is now decades in the past. Before you go, one last time. For all of it. For what I did to you. Thank you. It's a very tender scene. It's emotionally powerful. I don't believe for one second that that's what really happened. It seems unlikely to me that Edward would be the one asking for forgiveness or somehow mellowing with age and becoming regretful and remorseful. This portrayal is debated by many. If anything, he was always waiting for forgiveness, for them to offer him an apology for the way they treated his wife. I, I think it was too late to talk about the abdication and what had happened at that point. So what do experts believe was said during their secret conversation? The implication that they were sort of on intimate terms in the Crown, I think, is, is, is entirely misleading. I think it was much more likely that it would have been a, a fairly formal conversation. The Queen is not one to share confidences with people that she doesn't trust. It's perfectly possible that they discussed the racing at Longchamp rather than going over this whole painful royal saga once again. I think the Queen doesn't get involved in a lot of great emotional drama or certainly 
you know, unpicking the past. But according to their private secretary, it was incredibly healing and that there was an affection between the two. One popular perception of the meeting, largely due to the dramatic license of the Crown, is that Edward gave the Queen letters that he'd received from her son Charles. Take the letters, read them. I can't do that. It's a private correspondence. They concern the future of the Crown. Charles, at Lord Mountbatten's urging, had, I think, been in touch with the Duke, but this idea of long letters in which Charles poured his heart out and which the Queen then read is, I think, a dramatic fantasy. This incredible photo found its way onto front pages around the world. Wallace Simpson face to face with the Queen. It was an attempt to close that very painful, uh, damaging chapter, both in her family story, but also, of course, in the, uh, the story of the monarchy in the middle of the 20th century. And judging from the farewells, it was a very relaxed occasion with one notable formality. The Duchess curtsied to Her Majesty during the farewells. What were the turbulent events that led to this historic moment and shaped Queen Elizabeth's unique relationship with her uncle? The young princess, Elizabeth, knew of her uncle as a source of trouble and strife and embarrassment and demands and gossip. In 1936, Princess Elizabeth was 10. She enjoyed a happy childhood with her parents, the Duke and Duchess of York, and her younger sister, Margaret. She had visualized herself for the first 10 years of her life as living much as her parents had done, as pretty much country mice. Living a life in a country house surrounded by horses and dogs and it all being very wholesome and nice. The young princess had an affectionate relationship with her uncle Edward, who lived nearby in Windsor. He'd been a, an affectionate uncle. He used to come round to the house and apparently play with Elizabeth. And, you know, they used to play Snap and Happy Families. This was a fun-loving uncle who liked messing around, playing around with his young nieces. And certainly it suggests that he, you know, spent time round the family, with the family. Apparently, there were times when she would knock on his door and he would be maybe smoking a pipe at his desk and so through slightly gritted teeth as, as she came in, he would say, well, don't forget your bloody curtsy because after all, she was Princess Elizabeth and he was the king, but it was like jokey. So that sort of relationship. Edward had been a small part of the young princess's life before he abdicated as he was focused on other interests. Remember, at this point, Edward is the Prince of Wales. He's very much a bachelor, uh, playboy prince, and his lifestyle was very different from the cosy domesticity of his brother, um, you know, his sister-in-law and his nieces. Yes, he was out in the nightclubs, he was having fun, he was very much a figure in London. People adored him. People particularly adored him who didn't know him, funnily enough. His office, people who worked for him um, when he was Prince of Wales, had serious reservations about him. Some historians believe that Edward's combination of royalty and celebrity is comparable only to Princess Diana's. He would have been this kind of glamorous, caddish kind of figure who his nieces would have looked upon, perhaps with a little bit of awe, amusement, fascination. Any relationship that Elizabeth did have with him diminished when Wallace Simpson came on the scene. Edward's obsession for Wallace did cause such disturbance within the family that it's quite hard to imagine uncle and niece Pletbino being together much in quite the same way after that. He had only one consideration in his mind and that was Wallace. He was besotted by her, infatuated by her in the most extraordinary way. Wallace's divorced status meant that their marriage was opposed by the government. 
When Edward chose love over duty and gave up the throne, Princess Elizabeth's life transformed overnight. I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. It was uh, an earthquake in both monarchy and family. And of course, the impact on George VI as he became the Queen's father was profound. He wasn't in the mold of Edward. He was charismatic, he was good looking, he was so popular. Whereas Bertie was cautious, nervous, stuttering. So it was a massive seismic shock, not just to the monarchy, but to the people who suddenly thought that their king, their beloved king, was forsaking them for this woman. Suddenly her father was the king, and she realized that she herself was going to be the queen. This is a moment of transformation for Princess Elizabeth because nothing is the same again after that. Margaret said, said to her famously, in you know, this famous conversation, does this mean you're gonna be queen? And Princess Elizabeth said, yes, I suppose it does. One can only try and imagine what that must have meant what, when that realisation came to Elizabeth, that her future now essentially wasn't her own. So from the age of 11, Princess Elizabeth is in training to become Queen Elizabeth II. The young Elizabeth's relationship with her uncle, whose personal decision thrust her into the spotlight, now transformed beyond recognition. The very amiable relationship that she'd had with her uncle, he'd obviously been around her as she'd grown up, and now he became a kind of persona non grata. He was exiled to, to France, and she didn't see him. Part of the deal absolutely was that the former king would leave the country. Apart from anything else, I think there was fear of, you know, his charismatic continued presence, casting a damper on, you know, on the new monarch. After the abdication, um, Edward went to join Wallace in France, where she had been living. And that was where they were married, quietly, you know, fairly privately, and with no member of the royal family in attendance. Once the favorite uncle of the young Princess Elizabeth uh, went into exile, uh, there was the beginnings of a serious family feud. A feud that would undoubtedly shape Elizabeth's views of her uncle in her teenage years. The Queen would only have heard intensely negative things about her so-called favorite uncle, Edward VIII. He had dumped the crown, literally, on his brother's head, out of nowhere. His brother's wife was the queen mother. She absolutely resented this sudden duty. On top of that, he had mired the royal family in scandal. He almost caused a constitutional crisis. She certainly was affected by it emotionally because her father was in a completely distraught state. I mean, he spent hours sobbing on his mother's shoulder, Queen Mary's shoulder, saying that he wasn't fit for uh, 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 inheriting the throne. Edward remained a constant presence in all of their lives, even as the Windsors descended into conflict including fierce tensions over money. Edward VIII, the outgoing king, felt that, you know, that he was entitled to really a fairly kingly income. Um, and this was not the view either of the rest of the royal family or of the British establishment. I think he said he was down to his last 90,000 uh, pounds. And this was a complete lie. He had about a million. He got an allowance of £25,000 a year from the purse, the private purse, of, of the king, of King George VI. It, it was a colossal sum of money. I mean, £1.6 million in modern-day cash, something like that. So they very much were, by um, 1940, they were brothers at war. Of all Edward's grievances with his family, 
the strongest was over their supposed mistreatment of his wife. He would spend the whole of his life complaining about it. Every time he had any contact with any of his relations, he would bring up the fact that they hadn't met and received Wallace, the fact that Wallace was due the title of HRH. He was like a stuck record. The young princess, Elizabeth, knew of her uncle as a source of trouble and strife and embarrassment and demands and gossip. I should think it was very difficult for the Queen to uh, have any sort of balanced view of her uncle. I think the Queen has, I'm slightly speaking out of turn here, occasionally referred to the Duke of Windsor as my silly uncle. Now living in bitter exile, what would Edward have made of his niece? We know that he called the Queen Shirley Temple, her kind of plumpish stature, her being rather sort of uptight. So there was a kind of ridiculing of her. Both Wallace and Edward were very hostile to particularly Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, Cookie, as they called her, you know, who, who they saw as being very set against them, uh, as was his own mother, Queen Mary. They didn't altogether extend that hostility to, to Princess Elizabeth. I doubt they really blamed the, the children for what they saw as the sins of the parents. As Elizabeth grew older and prepared herself for the role that her uncle had indirectly imposed upon her, the impact of his actions was already clear. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. When the Queen made her 21st birthday speech and pledged this allegiance to the country and to a life of service, in one sense that was quite pointed because it was reassuring the public that I'm not going to behave in the way that my uncle did. However, Elizabeth's relationship with her uncle would only become more turbulent. This obviously was a very difficult chapter uh, for the Queen and the royal family to explain. I mean, this was very clearly the Duke of Windsor, at the very least, flirting uh, with the Nazis. The relationship between Princess Elizabeth and her estranged Uncle Edward was already strained. But in February 1952, it reached a crisis following the death of King George VI and Elizabeth's accession to the throne. She'd become queen because of her father's death. And for many people, her uncle was ultimately responsible for that. So all kinds of mixed emotions. In the newly crowned Queen Elizabeth, the disgraced former king saw a possible opportunity to return to the family. The Duke of Windsor was rather hoping that things might change after she became queen. And um, he comes over for the funeral, he has a few meetings with the family, and then he realizes actually that, no, it isn't really going to change. After the funeral of George VI, he was not invited to the lunch. This was an incredible snub. It was a personal snub. Their relationship was formal, distant, not at all intimate, and it was going to get worse because she also insisted that he should not be invited to the coronation. At this most important ceremony for the new queen, one of the strongest voices objecting to Edward's presence was Elizabeth herself. This was a sacramental occasion, so she didn't want this contaminated by horrible memories of what had happened in 1936 at the abdication. Although the Duke was absent from the coronation, he was able to watch his niece at her crowning moment from his home in Paris. That must have been very poignant for him watching that because he would have been fully aware that if he hadn't married Wallace, um, this coronation certainly wouldn't be taking place at this time. The abdication crisis was now 17 years behind them. 
But the Queen put plenty of distance between herself and her disgraced uncle. I think the Queen knew exactly the mess that Edward had caused. Elizabeth was kept away from Edward as something pure would be kept away from something dirty. The new Queen was seen as the future of the monarchy. But Edward, by his own admission, had a reputation as a royal rebel. Speaking to the BBC in the late 1960s, the ailing Duke described how his clashes with the institution had been inevitable. In this illuminating interview. Even if you'd remained a bachelor, you might still have collided with the establishment. Yes, definitely. But not in a, not in a, in a, in a, in a bad way, but uh, no, I think maybe, I don't know, perhaps I'm, 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 I'm being conceited, but I think it might have helped the establishment too. <laughs> And what do you mean by that? Well, I think that it might have revived the, the thinking of the establishment. Edward was a scandal and selfishness. Elizabeth, the young queen, was the opposite. I don't think anyone in the royal family wanted Edward to be around Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth was absolutely dedicated to doing the right thing and she had been brought up in the conviction that the right path was the path of her father, George VI. You could almost define her own early vision of her monarchy as being not to be like Uncle David. Despite the distance between them, popular dramas like The Crown portray them as close confidants when the Queen faced one of her biggest dilemmas early in her reign, whether to allow her sister Margaret to marry a divorcee, Peter Townsend, she is shown taking advice from her banished uncle. I've been hoping to hear from you. I found myself hovering by the phone for days. It's about Margaret. Yes. She's portrayed as ringing up the Duke of Windsor, and the Duke of Windsor says, well, he was waiting for her call, he was hovering on the, on the, uh, around the, the telephone, waiting to pick it up and to give her advice about this situation. And are you for her too? But Margaret, la Marianne, how can I not be? I share with her the fate of having a great love that captured much of the country's imagination, only to have it forbidden by the establishment, so naturally my sympathy is with her. I see. The implication is that they were always sort of hobnobbing on the phone together um, is, is completely misplaced. The Crown certainly did make play on this question of a relationship between Edward and Elizabeth. Certainly I would have felt that he would be the last person whose advice the young queen would have sought. Not for one minute would Queen Elizabeth have sat there and thought, you know what, I'm gonna phone my playboy uncle and ask him about matters of state. Edward's abdication scandal in the 1930s was only the first of many difficulties he caused for the royal family. During Elizabeth's reign, the full extent of Edward's affiliations with Nazi Germany were revealed, following the discovery of secret documents. The Marburg files are a cache of tons, literally tons of documents, which were discovered by American investigators. Among other things, they reveal the closeness of the Duke of Windsor with the Nazi regime. After the war, great care was taken and both Churchill and the Queen Mother were leading voices in this, that this information, the Marburg files, did not come out. The files only became public knowledge in the late 1950s and revealed a more sinister connection between the Duke and Nazi Germany, especially a plot to install Edward as king following a successful Nazi invasion of Great Britain. They'd always, right through the war, been 
deep worry, controversy about just what the Duke's views were. These files showed that the Nazi regime had really high hopes of being able to either tempt or coerce the Duke of Windsor to their cause. That had they successfully invaded, perhaps he might have been set up as a pocket king returned to the throne. The Duke defended his association with the German dictatorship by arguing that he wanted to avoid the horrors that he'd witnessed in the First World War. His argument was, I've seen how terrible war is and so I want to avoid war at all costs. My theory is that he was behaving rather stupidly but by no means treacherously at all. And so it was rather unfortunate that all these things kept coming up to haunt him in later life. The slurs against the Windsors, that they were Nazi sympathisers, were just yet another convenient way to discredit them and to uh, destroy their reputation because that suited the establishment, it suited Parliament, it suited the politicians to discredit them and keep them out of the country. The scandal was troublesome for the monarchy. But what would it mean for Edward's relationship with Elizabeth? There was a huge furore, and this was very bad from the Queen's point of view. So she hated these revelations. This obviously was a very difficult chapter for the Queen and the royal family to explain. This was very clearly the Duke of Windsor, at the very least, flirting uh, with the Nazis. It left a very bitter taste in the mouth, but I'm not sure that it was directly uh, going to reflect on the Queen and in some sense implicate her in a way that would be ultimately threatening um, to her position or that of the monarchy. Elizabeth weathered the storm caused by her estranged uncle while he would spend almost the entirety of her reign in exile in a sprawling Parisian house. He returned to London in 1965 for an eye operation and his niece went to visit him in hospital. But like all previous meetings, it was away from public view. Then in 1967, a significant public meeting took place. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor attend their first public engagement in the presence of the Queen since the Duke's abdication. Although they'd previously met in private, this occasion somehow sets the seal on royal reconciliation. This was an opportunity to diffuse the family tensions. The Queen felt that it might be, you know, to everyone's advantage if signs of this feud could be eased. It's all very polite and amicable. And this is very disappointing for people, of course, who like feuds and like to think of, of everybody hating each other and, and being horrible to each other. The, the whole reason for doing that ceremony was to make things easier for the future. As she grew older, it seemed Queen Elizabeth was becoming more pragmatic about family relationships. Through the 60s, there is some evidence that the Queen, Elizabeth, had actually been trying to heal this rift to some degree. Passions would have subsided somewhat. The hurt might well have subsided too. Despite decades of turbulence after the abdication crisis, it seems the Queen's relationship with her uncle had mellowed. The scene was set for their historic final meeting. In 1972, while Elizabeth was in Paris, she met Edward one last time. At this point, the Queen hadn't seen her uncle for five years since the 1967 visit. He was only 10 days away from death and he was in a, a terrible state of health. And there was a feeling that some sort of reconciliation should take place because it would leave a nasty taste in the mouth of the public if he should die and the family should still be an unhappy family as opposed to a happy family. What had once been her beloved fun uncle David had become something of an outcast from the family. Nonetheless, the idea of the royal family was always going to be important to her. She would have wanted to pay her respects. <laughs> 
This meeting was an incredibly symbolic act of putting history to bed, putting the past in the past, and letting the world, the public, and the rest of the royal family know that the scandal should end now. With the passing of the Duke of Windsor, was there now an opportunity for the royal family to heal its old wounds? Or would Queen Elizabeth be haunted by memories of her fractured relationship with her uncle Edward? Queen Elizabeth is reminded of Edward and Wallace when she looks at, at Harry and Meghan. She's learned that these royal loose cannons have got to be controlled. bin lorry inevitable binges or a load in need of a lift come to daddy all the signs point to chaos on our roads recovery is hour to hour minute to minute we've got trouble we're busier than ever we can't get it out from under it oh i do Jeez, help. you still get a bit of a buzz when these jobs come in if you didn't you're probably in the wrong job moving these metal monsters is all in a day's work for these heavy rescue heroes we're going on the next job Trucking Hell. Watch now on My5. On the 5th of June, 1972, the royal family said goodbye to a former king. This was a simple service, a private act of remembrance by a small congregation of mourners. On top of the coffin, there was no crown, but a wreath from the Duchess of Windsor. The Queen arranged a private service for her uncle Edward, followed by a small burial ceremony attended by just 14 people. He was treated as a member of the royal family at the end, so quite a remarkable kind of reconciliation in death. It certainly suggests that he was being afforded the respect of a senior member of the royal family. Edward's death may have signalled the end of the royal family's darkest hour. When the Duke of Windsor died in 1972, perhaps it drew a line under, under a chain of events the royal family had always found it painful to contemplate, because those old wounds from 1936 had never really been healed. His existence was a perpetual reminder of the horrors of the abdication and the damage that he himself had done to the monarchy. That episode in royal history, which they'd done their best to uh, eradicate, could now be put firmly in the tomb. 
Elizabeth apparently forgave Edward for the trouble he caused their family. But more than 80 years since the abdication crisis, we are still captivated by the life of the man who was once king. We're still obsessed with the story of Edward VIII because it's spicy and exciting and glamorous and heightened. It's like a Greek drama playing itself out in the 20th century. The sacrifice of this supreme position of king gripped the imagination of everybody, and it still does. Edward may have wanted to be remembered as a doomed romantic, but history has not been kind to him. I think Edward's portrayal in popular culture as bitter, complaining, and utterly selfish and narcissistic is correct. There's sympathy for his quandary as a man who is in love, but equally there's a recognition that he had many faults and failings. There's a great scene in The Crown, which is based on fact, where Wallace and Edward are hosting a documentary crew at their lovely exiled home in France. I believe our editor agreed as part of the deal that you would give our readers some tips for entertaining. <laughs> did we agree that? You did, darling, yes. You paid extra. <laughs> Wallace and Edward showing the crew around and even the music is quite mocking and they're being asked questions about, you know, what are your top tips for entertaining? Okay, big smiles. Having had a naval background, I don't much care for fussy things or smells, but I do like a good, well-milled soap. They come across as very materialistic. No matter what the fashion, a, a well-cut suit in a, in a beautiful fabric will take you anywhere. They come across as obsessed with style, obsessed with image. The character of the hedonistic Edward is in total contrast with that of his niece Elizabeth, whose persona is one of duty and decorum. How different the royal uncle and niece seem to be. One's got to understand where the Queen is concerned, that, that her defence mechanism all the time is, is keeping her distance, retaining a, a, a sort of formal relationship. It's typified by Princess Margaret when somebody referred to the Queen and she said, you mean Her Majesty the Queen. The Queen retains that capacity of sort of frosty formality. Others feel that negative portrayals of the Duke of Windsor offer a misleading view of his true character. The way that the Windsors have been remembered in history is deeply unfair. Yes, they did live um, a rather aimless existence in exile, but the implication that they were nasty people just couldn't be further from the truth. Edward was a complex character. I think he did follow his heart, but I don't think that he was villainous. The monarchy was rocked by Edward's decision to abdicate. The Queen's experience of that crisis seems to have influenced the way she deals with later generations of royals who step out of line. Queen Elizabeth is reminded of Edward and Wallace when she looks at, at Harry and Meghan. History doesn't repeat itself exactly, but it plays a very similar tune. There's always that tension between family and feelings and duty and service. And I think we've probably seen glimpses of that in the statements that the Queen's made in regard to Harry and Meghan. Clearly disappointed as grandmother, sorrow for their sort of deciding to step back from their duties, but ultimately it is about duty. She's learnt really from the experience of Edward VIII that these royal loose cannons have got to be controlled. Hence I think the treatment of Harry, the fact that he has been sidelined in quite the way that the Duke of Windsor was. He constitutes a threat. In a sense, the Duke of Windsor's legacy is the effect he and his abdication had on the attitudes of Britain's royal family. The Queen, after all, was raised on 
this idea that Uncle Edward had quit the royal family, had basically let the side down, and that once out, he had to remain out. You can't compare personally the Windsors with their very aimless and self-serving life of pleasure seeking with the Sussexes and their determination to use their voice to support good causes. But there was once again that feeling that if you step outside of royal ranks, step outside the royal family, it's very, very hard to be forgiven and welcomed back in. The Queen's reign has been defined by a strict sense of duty before family, the opposite of the path taken by her uncle. This is the legacy left by King Edward VIII to the British monarchy. It was such a scandal within the family that he was seen to jettison duty it almost became more ingrained um, in the Queen that she mustn't act like her uncle. So indirectly, by abdicating, her commitment to the role and her sense of duty has been enforced. And because of that, she's been such an immensely successful and wonderful monarch. The Queen's sense of duty is precisely a reaction against the irresponsibility and the undutifulness of Edward VIII. The moment you step out of line in the way that Edward VIII did, you risk the stability of the whole institution. Her watchword is unity, stability, continuity, tradition. And by doggedly pursuing those goals, she has sustained the institution in the most extraordinary way. She's effectively kept the show on the road by not being the Duke of Windsor. <laughs>